Hi, I'm Jana, and welcome to another episode of Living Healthy. This show is brought to you by the Durham Diabetes Coalition, a partnership working towards improving the quality of life for adults living with type 2 diabetes in Durham County. We hope this show gives you the information and tools you need to take charge of your health. On this episode, we're going to take a closer look at the Durham Diabetes Coalition. We'll hear from the local health professionals on ways to make your favorite comfort foods healthier and what is myth versus fact about diabetes and the steps you should take to get the most out of your next doctor's visit. We'll also find out how one local organization helped a Durham resident set the path to fitness. And we'll see how one Durham resident's journey was affected by watching her loved ones deal with diabetes. If you can't write down the information you see during this episode fast enough, don't worry, we'll recap everything at the end of the show. All of the information will also be available on the website at durhamdiabetescoalition.org. The Durham Diabetes Coalition has neighborhood intervention, geospatial, and clinical teams working in the community to cut down on the death and injury from type 2 diabetes. Let's meet a couple of people from the neighborhood intervention team so they can tell us what type of impact they're having on diabetes in Durham. The Durham Diabetes Coalition is a collaboration among the Durham County Department of Public Health, Duke University, the Center for Geospatial Medicine at the University of Michigan, and other Durham Health partners. The Durham Diabetes Coalition has a community and a clinical team. The community team is a team that's actually in the community where people work, live, and play. The neighborhood intervention team exists to increase awareness about type 2 diabetes and the serious complications that this disease can cause. We further exist to provide community-based activities. The overall goal is to improve health outcomes and quality of life for people living with type 2 diabetes and those who are undiagnosed. We do this by providing patient education, linking resources, and providing health interventions. In the community, we go to various organizations and churches and we provide a wide variety of diabetes presentations. We assist with health fairs and we also offer diabetes self-management and chronic disease self-management programs. So we want to help diagnose those who don't know. And for those with type 2 diabetes, we want to help them better manage their diabetes, which will reduce their risk for complications such as amputations. Community partners are important in what we're trying to achieve with the Derm Diabetes Coalition because they help us to connect resources with community members, especially when there are resources that are helpful to community members and they may not be aware of. You know, we're always there to listen and we listen to uh, what they need and we try to provide them with what they need. Geospatial mapping helps us to identify the uh, high-risk areas for diabetes. For example, in our target area one, um, we, are, we were able to identify almost 600 people living with diabetes. Um, and that was done through the geospatial mapping. We're focusing in the first neighborhood because there are large cases of type 2 diabetes. And the same goes for the second and third neighborhoods, but it's just not as high as in our first area. This helps us just to understand where the most services are needed. To have a lasting impact, some things I would like to see are um, the creation of walking groups, support groups that we're working to get in the communities if they're able to sustain them when we're gone. We do plan to empower community members to be able to do diabetes presentations and offer education to other community members on diabetes. So with that, we hope that that'll be a way for people to continue spreading the word about type 2 diabetes and better ways to manage diabetes. When this project ends, the lasting impact that I would like to see are some of our initiatives continue. We don't want everything to end when the project ends because type 2 diabetes does not have an end. Chastity, Linda, and the rest of the Neighborhood Intervention Team have been very busy working with Durham community partners to improve quality of life in adults living with type 2 diabetes. Like Chastity said, it's important to connect resources to the community and empower residents to take control of diabetes. One way to get empowered is to take control of your health. 
Let's see how One Durham Organization helps residents to do just that. Uh, the Durham YMCA has four facilities uh, here in Durham. We have the Downtown YMCA, the American Tobacco YMCA, the Lakewood YMCA, and the Hope Valley YMCA. I oversee adult programs like personal training, group fitness, bonus classes for our YMCA's in Durham. The YMCA works often with outside partners to accomplish our goals, um, to include Durham County Public Health Department, uh, Duke Medicine, um, several um, uh, counseling facilities. Um, we also work with Wake Med. Um, there's a couple of coalitions against childhood obesity we work with as well. Um, so we can't do it alone. We work with a lot of community organizations. I like to work at the YMCA because I get to work with my community. Um, I get to work hand in hand, side by side, um, with individuals each day that are focused on becoming healthier. And so I get to see people's lives being changed, um, whether they're losing weight or whether they're getting off blood pressure medicine or reducing um, their cholesterol levels. Or um, I'm really excited when I hear people that are pre-diabetics, they're no longer in that range. I was diagnosed with high blood pressure. So my blood pressure was like 210 over 120. And I, I had a sister actually to pass from um, complications from being inactive. So I said that I needed to make a change. So this is where I came from. When I started to lose weight, people were saying, oh, I noticed that you're losing weight. People that I haven't seen maybe in a couple of years, they would constantly say, um, I noticed that you're still losing weight. You look great. When I renewed my vows, uh, I was a little smaller, but not where I needed to be. And since that time, I've lost 130 pounds. And that's through just changing the way I eat, knowing how to eat, and the exercises. It's proven that individuals have higher self-esteem when they work out, and so it's not just about how you look, but how you feel as a person. I just really have a burst of energy that I, you wouldn't believe. Uh, we offer community wellness classes. Um, we do a class inside the YMCA called My Life that uh, focuses on exercise and nutrition um, and self-care. And we also bring that class outside the YMCA. We've done it at a couple of churches. Um, and we've been piloting it at a couple of schools as well. I lost the weight, but then I gained it back. And this My Life program actually shows you how to be consistent in your weight loss if you follow the program. My biggest accomplishment is this April, I did a half marathon. I never thought that I could run 13.1 miles for, to accomplish that. I never thought that, never. The Y actually helped train me for that because they offer programs, again, where they start you out slowly and we built on that every week. And um, I was able to get across the finish line. If you're inactive, start walking. Um, just walking will help improve your fitness level. Um, if you're already um, moving, um, take it up a notch. American Heart Association recommends uh, 30 minutes of physical activity a day. And so we recommend at least three times a week, up to five or six times a week, um, being active and doing something. Don't come home from work, sit on the couch, come home from work, um, make dinner, and then take a walk around the neighborhood. And so maybe you walk for five minutes, and then up to 10 minutes, and then to 15 minutes, until before you know it, you're walking 30 to 45 minutes, and you've started being active. I would say just start, just start at your level. Everyone may not can run a half marathon, but I came from just running just a mile to running two miles, and then three, and so forth and so on. It's the little changes that you make. Find what class works for you. It may just be walking. And then you have to find a partner that is encouraging to you. Or find someone that supports you and if nothing else, come to the Y. We'll support you. We also offer financial assistance for individuals that can't afford the YMCA. And so perhaps you can't, um, you feel like you can't afford the YMCA, you can. You can afford any one of our facilities. And so come check us out. To find more information about the YMCA, you would check out ymcatriangle.org. Um, there's a lot of information about our community programs, our programs that are going on inside the facility for 
um, adults, kids, um, seniors, anyone with disabilities. Um, you can also check out any one of our four facilities. You can come in, take a tour. Um, someone will give you information provided, um, providing our services and what we do here at the YMCA. The YMCA offers great community programs to support healthy lifestyle goals. Ms. Shirley took full advantage of these programs and fellowship between Y members to get her health back on track. As Ms. Shirley stated, she started slowly and built her way up one small goal at a time. You can too. Nutrition is an important part of a healthy lifestyle. Next, let's watch Christy prepare some southern favorites that Miss Shirley might enjoy. Some of the best family memories I have are Sunday dinners at my grandmother's house. We'd have traditional southern favorites like fried chicken, cornbread, fresh vegetables from the garden, and of course something sweet. Let's face it, we all like comfort food, and eating a meal together is a great way to spend time with your loved ones. Most people with diabetes think these traditional southern foods are off limits, but today, we're gonna make over some of your favorite southern dishes that not only taste good, they're good for you. First, I need to wash my hands before I start cooking. So let's get started with fried chicken. Traditional fried chicken is full of fat, and that's not so good for your heart. Eating foods that are too high in fat can increase your risk of heart attacks and strokes. Today, we're gonna bake our chicken instead of frying. I've decided to use a pound of chicken drumsticks because they were on sale at the grocery store. To stick with my food budget, I usually buy the cut of meat that's on sale that week. First, preheat the oven to 400 degrees. Next, we'll need to marinate the chicken to make it juicy inside. Combine a third of a cup of low-fat buttermilk, a teaspoon of chili powder, a half teaspoon of oregano, a quarter teaspoon of cumin, and a quarter teaspoon of black pepper in a shallow dish. We're using spices to flavor our food instead of salt. Dip the chicken drumsticks in the buttermilk mixture. Meanwhile, prepare the breading by placing one cup of breadcrumbs in a shallow dish. Roll the marinated chicken in the breadcrumbs and place them on a baking sheet. Spray the chicken with cooking spray and bake for 40 to 50 minutes. Until the chicken is cooked through, turning the chicken once, halfway through, around 25 minutes. You always want to cook chicken thoroughly until a meat thermometer registers 165 degrees. Now I need to make sure to thoroughly wash my hands, especially after touching raw poultry, before moving on to the next dish. So while the chicken is in the oven, let's go ahead and work on our vegetables. Traditional collard greens are usually seasoned with ham hocks, which are high in fat and salt. In this recipe, we're gonna lower the fat and salt content in our greens by using lower sodium chicken broth and turkey bacon. Start with about two pounds of collard greens that have been thoroughly washed and chopped, making sure to remove the stems. In a large pot, heat one teaspoon of olive oil over medium heat. Olive oil is a heart-healthy oil. Add one chopped onion, two cloves of chopped garlic, and two slices of chopped, uncooked turkey bacon and cook for about five minutes. Add the collard greens, a 14 ounce can of low sodium chicken broth, and a quarter teaspoon of black pepper and bring to a boil. Reduce heat and simmer about one hour until the greens are tender. To give your greens an extra boost of flavor, sprinkle with a little cider vinegar just before you eat them. Now on to dessert. My grandmother made the best banana pudding, but it was loaded with fat and sugar. By using sugar-free versions of the ingredients, we can cut way back on our sugar intake. Today, we're gonna prepare an easy no-bake banana pudding trifle. The key here is portion control. Keep in mind, this dessert serves 16 people. Start by preparing the sugar-free pudding. Beat or whisk together three packages of sugar-free instant vanilla pudding with three cups of fat-free milk together in a bowl. In a large glass bowl, or trifle bowl if you have it, place a third of a box of reduced fat vanilla wafers in the bottom. Layer two sliced bananas on top of the wafers. Spread one half of the pudding mixture on top of the bananas. Repeat the layers, ending up with vanilla wafers and sliced bananas on top. 
Finish the banana pudding with sugar-free, fat-free, frozen whipped topping. The serving size for this dessert is three quarters of a cup, so remember to watch your portions. Today, we prepared a traditional Southern meal that was lower in fat, sugar, and salt by making simple substitutions. We baked our meat instead of frying, used lower sodium broth, and used sugar-free versions of our ingredients. To make a healthy plate, aim to fill half your plate with non-starchy vegetables, such as our collard greens. The other quarter of our plate is for protein, such as our oven fried chicken legs. The last quarter of our plate is reserved for our carbohydrates or starches. Notice on my plate, I have a smaller portion of peas so that I can make room for my banana pudding without going over my limit for carbohydrates at this meal. I encourage you to speak with a registered dietitian to develop a meal plan based on your specific needs. By changing the way you cook, substituting a few key ingredients, and watching your portions, you can continue to enjoy your favorite comfort foods. It's great to know that you can make your favorite Southern dishes and not have to worry about lots of extra fat or sugar. Christy made some healthy changes like using spices instead of salt, seasoning with a leaner meat like turkey bacon, and using sugar-free ingredients to create a heart-healthy meal. I get a little excited thinking of trying that oven-baked fried chicken myself. Another aspect of being healthy is making sure you get the best possible health care. Next, let's follow a patient as she gets ready for a visit to her doctor. The average doctor's visit lasts between 15 and 20 minutes. Think back to your last appointment. Did you get through everything you wanted to with your health care provider in the time you had? Or did you get home and think of more questions like that headache you had last week, or if insurance will cover a test he or she mentioned? Even though appointments seem brief, you can make the most out of the time you have with your provider by becoming an active and involved member of your health care team. This means being prepared by knowing which concerns you want to talk about and asking questions. The first step in getting ready for your appointment is to make a list of the top three things you want to discuss with your provider. These topics can cover things like symptoms, medications, or treatment options. Also, jot down questions you have related to your concerns. If there are other items you'd like to discuss, you can add those too in case you have time to bring them up. There are many ways you can keep track of your health information. You can write a list on paper or create one on a mobile device like a smartphone or tablet. You can also create a Word document on your computer that you can update and print out. Where you record your information isn't as important as having it in a format you can take with you easily. Next, either bring your medications with you to the appointment or make a list of them. Be sure to include over-the-counter medications, vitamins, and natural remedies. If you do decide to make a list of current medications, be sure to include the dosage. If you are seeing a new provider, it will be helpful for them to know about your health history. What illnesses, health problems, or surgeries have you had in the past? Current conditions are an important part of your health history as well. Note all of these and make sure to update your health history regularly and take it with you. Then you'll be able to refer to your health history when your provider asks instead of using up precious time trying to remember. Something else to think about is whether you want to bring a family member or loved one with you to your appointment. Medical appointments can get complicated with all of the treatment and follow-up care information discussed.